Have you ever wondered why honey drips slower than water? Well, it's time to stick around and find the answer. Welcome to the world of fluids, a realm where seemingly simple substances conceal a universe of scientific wonders. So, what exactly is a fluid? It's not just a fancy term for liquids, nope, it's broader than that. A fluid is any substance that can flow and take the shape of its container. It includes both liquids, like our friend water, and gases, like the air we breathe. Yes, you heard right, the air around us is also a fluid. Shocking, isn't it? Now let's talk about a characteristic of fluids that affects their flow. Viscosity. Picture yourself trying to swim in a pool of honey, and then in a pool of water. In which pool do you think you'd struggle more? If you guessed honey, you're absolutely right. That's because honey is more viscous than water. Viscosity, in simple terms, is the measure of a fluid's resistance to flow. It's like the internal friction within the fluid. A fluid with high viscosity, like honey, resists flow more than a fluid with low viscosity, like water. It's like the difference between wading through a bustling crowd at a concert and a leisurely stroll in the park. But what affects this viscosity? Temperature is a major player. As the temperature increases, the viscosity of a liquid decreases. It's like how we become more relaxed and free-flowing on a warm sunny day, compared to a chilly winter morning. Viscosity also depends on the type of molecules in a fluid and how they interact with each other. In honey, the molecules stick together more than in water, making it harder for them to slide past each other, thus slowing the flow. So, next time when you're waiting for that honey to drop, remember, it's all about viscosity. Why does a ship float while a nail sinks? Density holds the answer. Now let's dive into the world of density, shall we? Density is essentially the child of mass and volume. In simpler terms, it's how much stuff is packed into a certain space. Picture a suitcase. If you pack it with feathers, it's light, right? But if you pack the same suitcase with rocks, it becomes heavy. The rocks and feathers have the same volume. They take up the same amount of space, but the rocks have more mass. So in our world of science, the rocks would have a higher density because they have more mass packed into the same volume. This is the core relationship between mass, volume, and density. The greater the mass and the smaller the volume, the higher the density. Let's take this a step further and talk about the different states of matter. Solids, liquids, and gases all have different densities, and this comes down to how their particles are arranged. That's the particle theory of matter. In solids, particles are tightly packed together, like sardines in a can. They're so close, they could whisper secrets to each other. This results in a high density. Liquids, on the other hand, have particles that are less tightly packed. Picture a dance floor with enough room for everyone to bust a move. That's our liquid. Fewer secrets, more dancing. This results in a medium density. And then, we have gases. Particles and gases are like the stars in the sky, far apart and free to roam. This results in a low density. So why does a ship float while a nail sinks? Well, the ship, although massive, is designed in a way that it displaces more water, which means it has a large volume, resulting in a lower density than the water. The nail, however, has a higher density than water because its mass is packed into a small volume, so it sinks. Next time you see a ship, remember it's not just floating, it's mastering density. Ever noticed how your bike tire gets hard when you pump air into it? Here's a fun fact. It's all about compressibility. But before we dive in, Let's set the stage with a quick rundown of what compressibility actually is. Essentially, compressibility is a measure of how much a substance can be compacted or squashed. Now let's imagine we have two balloons, one filled with water, and the other with air. If we apply pressure to both, the water-filled balloon doesn't change much in size, while the air-filled balloon shrinks significantly. The reason behind this is that gases, like the air in the balloon, are highly compressible while liquids like the water are virtually incompressible. This is because the particles in a gas are spread out, providing a lot of space to squeeze them closer together. However, the particles in a liquid are already close together, leaving little room for further compression. Now let's circle back to our bike tire scenario. When you pump air into the tire, you're compressing the air into a small space, making the tire hard. The air's compressibility allows it to be squeezed into the tire, providing the necessary rigidity for a smooth and bouncy ride. Compressibility doesn't just make bike rides fun, it also has some super cool technological applications. For instance, air compressors used in construction or manufacturing industries work on this principle. They compress air into a storage tank, increasing its potential energy. When the compressed air is released, it expands rapidly, 
driving the operation of various tools and machinery. In the field of aeronautics, the compressibility of gases is critical. It helps engineers design jet engines and understand how changes in air pressure affect the performance of an aircraft. In summary, the world around us is full of examples where the compressibility of fluids, particularly gases, plays a vital role. From bike tires to air compressors and jet engines, the principle of compressibility is at work, making our lives easier and more efficient. So the secret behind your bike tire's hardness is all about compressibility. Ever wondered why a soda can explode when shaken and opened? Well, sit tight because we're about to dive into the fascinating world of pressure, volume, and temperature, and how these three elements form a triangle of scientific intrigue. Let's kick off with pressure. Imagine you're in a crowd at a concert, everyone is jostling for space and you feel squished. Remember how that's what particles in a compressed gas or liquid feel like? They are under pressure. The more you compress them, the more they want to spread out, causing the pressure to rise. Now let's talk volume. The volume is simply the space these particles have to move around. When we decrease the volume, like when you squish a soda can, you're giving the particles less room to move, which increases the pressure. It's like trying to cram all your friends into a tiny car. It gets pretty cramped. Temperature, the third corner of our triangle, is a measure of the energy of these particles. The hotter the temperature, the more energy the particles have and the faster they move. If you heat up a gas or liquid, the particles move faster and collide more often and with more force, increasing the pressure. So, what happens when you shake a soda can and then open it? You rapidly increase the pressure inside the can by forcing the carbon dioxide gas out of the soda and into the small space at the top of the can. When you open the can, you suddenly decrease the volume that the pressurized gas occupies. With less space and a lot of energy, the gas forces its way out of the can in an explosive rush. Therefore, the pressure, volume, and temperature of a gas or liquid are all interconnected. Change one and the others will respond accordingly. It's a delicate balance, a dance of science if you will. So, the explosive surprise from a shaken soda can is all about pressure, volume, and temperature. It's science in action, right in your hand. Next time you're about to pop open a soda, give a nod to the scientific principles at play. Did you know that when you dive into a pool, the water pushes back at you? Let's dive into this a bit more. When you jump into a swimming pool, you're not just splashing around in water. You're immersing yourself in a fascinating field of forces, all thanks to our good friend, fluid dynamics. In fluids, forces are distributed in all directions. Think of it like being in a massive, super-friendly mosh pit, where every push or shove you give is returned in kind from all sides. This is because, according to the particle theory of matter, particles and fluids are constantly in motion, colliding with each other and the walls of their container. Now let's bring Pascal into the pool party. No, not your friend Pascal, but the 17th century French scientist, Blaise Pascal. He formulated a principle we now call Pascal's Law. This law states that pressure applied to a fluid is transmitted equally in all directions. Picture this. You have a closed container filled with water. If you apply pressure to one part of the fluid, let's say by pushing down on a piston, that pressure is distributed equally throughout the fluid. This is why when you squeeze one end of a water-filled balloon, the other end also bulges out. This principle is fundamental to so many technologies we use today. Hydraulic systems like car brakes or the machines used to lift heavy objects rely on this principle. When you press the brake pedal, you're applying force to a small piston, which increases the pressure in the brake fluid. This pressure is then transmitted equally throughout the fluid, applying a force to a larger piston and bringing your car to a smooth stop. Pretty cool, right? Understanding the forces in fluids and how they're transferred is not just about making a splash at the pool. It's about understanding the world around us and the principles that make our daily life possible. So remember, when you dive into a pool, you're not just swimming you're experiencing forces in fluids. Why does water flow faster through a narrow pipe than a wide one? This question may seem simple, but the answer lies in the intricate science of fluid dynamics. One of the main factors that influence the flow of fluids is the diameter of the pipe it's flowing through. Imagine two pipes, one wide and the other narrow, each with water flowing through them. You might think that since the wider pipe has more space, the water should flow through it faster. But in reality, the opposite is true the water flows faster through the narrow pipe. Why is that? This is because the flow rate of a fluid is inversely proportional to the cross-sectional area of the pipe. So, the smaller the area, the faster the flow. 
This principle is known as the law of continuity. It's a bit like when you put your thumb over the end of a garden hose to make the water squirt out faster. By decreasing the area, you speed up the flow. But that's not the only factor at play here. The viscosity of the fluid also plays a significant role. Remember that viscosity is essentially a measure of a fluid's resistance to flow. Or in our example at the beginning of this video, we think of it like the stickiness of a fluid. Then there's the pressure difference across the pipe. Fluids always flow from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure. So if the pressure is higher at the start of the pipe than at the end, the fluid will flow through the pipe. Lastly, the smoothness of the pipe's interior can affect the fluid flow. A smooth pipe reduces friction and allows the fluid to flow more freely, while a rough pipe increases friction and slows the flow. So, the next time you see water flowing, remember it's not just moving, it's flowing with science. So, we've journeyed through the fascinating world of fluids, but what does it all mean? Well, let's take a moment to recap. First, we dove into the concept of viscosity, the measure of a fluid's resistance to flow. Remember, the thicker the fluid, the higher its viscosity. Just think of honey versus water. Honey is thicker, so it has a higher viscosity. Then we tackled density, that is the relationship between mass and volume. In terms of the particle theory of matter, solids are the densest followed by liquids and then gases. It's like a party. Solids are the wallflowers sticking close together, liquids are the dancers with a bit more space, and gases are the social butterflies, occupying all the available space. We also discussed the compressibility of liquids and gases. Gases are more compressible than liquids due to the larger spaces between their particles. This property of gases makes them useful in technologies like air-filled tires and aerosol cans. Following that, we explored the relationship between pressure, volume, and temperature in fluids. If you compress or heat a liquid or gas, its pressure will increase. It's like when you heat up a can of soda, the pressure inside increases, and when you open it, it releases in a fizzy explosion. We then delved into how forces are transferred in fluids, thanks to our friend Pascal's law, which states that pressure applied to a fluid is transmitted equally in all directions. Lastly, we looked at factors affecting the flow of fluids. Factors like the fluid's viscosity, the size of the area it's flowing through, and the pressure difference from one end to the other, can all impact its flow. Next time you interact with fluids remember, there's a whole world of science behind it.